Um, so I guess this is the seventh time that you've worked with Rolf um, and you've worked with David on a couple of films as well. So you've obviously got a good working relationship and it seems this film has a number of people that Rolf's worked with before. It's very collaborative, it seems like, the coming together of many years of working um, in the industry and on Australian film. How was the relationship on this film for you and how did you come to the project? Uh, yes, yeah, it's true, I didn't know it was seven, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've had a great relationship. There's no... We've had a great relationship of myself. Um, Rolf is very much a doer and very much someone who um, um, works through the process on all levels. So they contribute to Rolf is very, very easy. Um, uh, as far as, um, yes, James Curry, who did the sound design on this, James does also the post sound as well as locations in it. He's um, been there probably with his Rolf longer than myself, but in the days of um, a film called Bad Boy, I think it was where I first um, attached myself with Rolf. Um, yeah, and James has always been a very integral part of uh, the team. Um, and in and out of that, there's others. Um, uh, within the concept of how Rolf works, I've always tried, it's come out of South Australia most of the time. Um, I lived in both Victoria and New South Wales, and so I've endeavoured to use um, South Australian crew uh, just to keep it part of the process, and, and um, that's worked really well. This particular um, um, occasion wasn't quite the same. But, uh, uh, crew from, you know, all over really, I suppose. Um, yeah, you know, and also in, um, Tanya Mimi is the editor on the show, and Tanya's been on with Rolf for quite some period of time, so they have a very good relationship, and an editor always says to do a so. <laughs> it seems too that the process of writing this film was extremely collaborative between Rolf and David, that, you know, that came out of conversations that they had together. How was that for you with the cinematography? Did, did you collaborate together on the storyboards? Was it, um, you know, I mean, you must have a very good instinctive trust relationship with Rolf by now after working on so many projects, but how did that process of actually putting it together um, and kind of compositing the, the shot ideas? Um, I suppose part of the um, process for any uh, cinematographer is really to um, contribute and give it a look and um, that can be sometimes an easy conversation to have with the director or it can be quite a confusing conversation to have and the reason I say that is because um, it's an area that some folk want to go into and a look means, you know, um, probably a colour palette, you know, whether it's going to look green or red or pink or purple or whether it's going to be, you know, just good old fashioned Australian outback as we see it. And it isn't very important for a DOP to, to start these conversations. So over the time with Rolf, it's an area that he probably hasn't dabbled in a lot. And so by the nature of being around him and having faith with me, then these conversations are much easier to have and they roll into what you're doing when you are shooting. The, um, um, uh, Rolf is very strong on um, the visual sense of what he requires out of a frame. So as a director of photography, what you're doing is getting to that position on the set, in the location, with the cast, as quickly as possible. So then what happens is what you're doing is finessing what you want out of the film and the frame you want. So um, that's what I pride myself in, that understanding Rolf very quickly, um, putting the mechanics into place very quickly, and um, the personnel on the set, is just to keep them um, in this particular film with, with David, um, in, there's a, a, a script that's been written and there's a, a film that's been achieved and they actually are quite different, I have to say, if I had, had anything to say about it. So as much as I knew the script and as much as I knew what might be required from scene to scene, we had to be very uh, flexible how we approached a lot of things. There's a really beautiful sense of pacing in this film as well that I think is largely driven by the cinematography. Um, and I was curious as to how much of that was something that you were very conscious of or if some of that also came just from David's actions. I mean, there's some really beautiful moments where David's coming into frame and then the camera kind of picks up, follows him, and then maybe stops and lets him continue off in, on his journey. And I really think we get a sense of Charlie's country of his trajectory and, and a sense of the timing of that life as well through the camera movements. So maybe if you could speak a little to that. 
Yeah, I mean, in fairness to um, the process, it's, it, it does happen on the day. Um, it isn't something that Rolf and I have actually talked about, I have to say, but once you, um, you have gone through a process of where scenes are going to be shot in the order and where they're going to fit and what you do from day to day over a period of time, um, but in framing up and then seeing how the cast um, deliver what they need to deliver is how you think that oh, this frame needs to be wider and give, give it a little bit more space here. Um, and to say that uh, this film is it's not the first time Rolf and I have done it in a digital process, and there's an interesting question for you to bring up, but it is a film that um, allowed us a few more takes, which we've never done in the past, um, which then allows us to be a bit more creative with uh, our options. And so then it's left to Tanya. Tanya then really fits that with Rolf as to whether that option was the right way to go or not. So. Yeah, maybe actually if you could talk about um, the digital aspect, because I think is it The King is Dead was the first one that you shot digitally with Rolf. And prior to that, obviously, you know, the, the kind of difference of being tied up with the machinery that doesn't enable necessarily the same things. Did, did that benefit you on this feature, being able to shoot digitally? Um, benefit? Mm, interesting. <laughs> or, or any other word. <laughs> um, oh, look, uh, there's a bit, you know, I, I am an old filmmaker and so is Rolf, and we always discuss film first over any other um, format or media that we could capture an image on. But the reality is that um, uh, data is with us, and, um, and so in this particular case, uh, one of the things I did ask for, and in fairness to Rolf, we got, because the budgets are tight, um, was the best of the best. So we had, um, um, we brought our, uh, lenses in from overseas, we had uh, the Alexa, um, the studio, all the benefits of that, um, and so, you know, that's where the money was. So that's really fantastic. So, you know, this, in comparison to a film that's shot somewhere else around the world, we're, we're as competitive on the floor and to get those looks. So, and, and in fairness to Rolf, it's just a really great way of looking at things. The King is Dead was a little bit of an experiment. It was a film that, you know, Rolf wanted to have um, under his belt as another genre for him. And um, we work in a very low, um, um, uh, presume, the pro I think they call it medium, it worked, I believe, um, but we weren't going there again, we made that experiment. Mm. Um, and the film played at Cannes to a great reception, um, you know, the reports out here were that it had a standing ovation, you know, we know that David Goblo won the Best Actor Award in the Answer Regards section. What was the experience, because you were actually at Cannes when the film was screening, um, how did it feel to you to, to see that international reaction? Um, yeah, no, it's stoked, absolutely stoked, I think, you know, for, for a small film that, you know, <laughs> we're in the, uh, I don't know, mosquitoes, with mosquitoes and sand flies and um, snakes, I suppose, and a few other um, creepy crawly things, it, um, no, it's just fantastic to be there, and the, the, the whole persona of the film um, was received extremely well, um, the, um, uh, to sit there and see people get up and clap for it, and then, um, uh, and that process you know, received it's very well. A little bit of this, um, Rolf has an amazing um, um, rapport with the, with, with the French and Khan and the, the process of them. So he, he was something that was hyped up quite a bit, which really helped the process. Um, but David's performance, I mean, you can't, you've seen it tonight. It's just phenomenal, it's just brilliant. It is, it's incredible. We'll open up to audience questions in just a moment, so if you've got some, start thinking about them. I just wanted to ask about the last shot that we get as the credits are rolling, and we've, we've got, you know, this sort of perspective of looking at Charlie, but looking at David, and um, I really think there's a sense, too, in this film, we know it's not his autobiography, but also that some of the experiences did come out of things he knows about and maybe has, you know, some relation to in his own life. And that last lingering shot as the credits are rolling, I think, is probably one of the most effective images in this film. It's really beautiful. Um, absolute credit to you to capture that. And Rolf talks about just being able to sort of put a camera on David um, because, you know, he's, his face is and he's just such an incredible actor that so much comes out of that. I wonder if you could talk about the experience of actually shooting that last shot because I imagine it must have been quite emotional or, you know, a, you know, a fairly sort of big moment to just be looking so intently at, like, Australia's best, most famous actor. I wasn't thinking that at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I 
um, to be truthful. <laughs> um, look, uh, I don't know. Sorry, it's a question, really. Cause <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's okay. Um, look, uh, David is a devil if you do and you're devil if you don't. So, um, for all the uh, iconic things I think we uh, in the industry should acknowledge to David, uh, he can be uh, at times not as cooperative one would have hoped. So there's a bit of truth coming out. Um, um, and uh, so the role for uh, and David relationship was very uh, a very um, moulded process at this time. There needed to be certain things for the film to finish. And um, I'm not quite sure David saw it the same way as Rolf. <laughs> and so out of that. Um, we have this situation, and, it, and, it, and it's something for us as Australians to understand. It's all very well to go into the outback, and it's all very well to, to develop a, um, a script, and it's all very well to say we can make this work, but it is hard work. And Rolf needs, you know, we need to tip our hat off to Rolf. It is an extremely hard process, um, and David uh, acknowledges Rolf, there's no doubt about that, and, and Rolf acknowledges David. But the relationship, like any good film that's going to be successful, has these edges that you know, aren't always round. They can be very square at time and can hurt. So this happens to be one of those scenes. <laughs> um, but yes, in, in, in the contents of the film, it's just fantastic how it finished. Um, um, and um, also within uh, Indigenous community, the right to teach um, someone to dance is actually very tricky. Um, unless you've been blessed with that, unless that's been handed down, you have no rights. And so it also had, dare I call it politics, but there it had a underlying um, issues for us to shoot. So then it got more and more um, a bit of an issue at that time. But anyway, so be it. It, um, it moved on. I'm not sure I've answered your question, but. <laughs> that was lovely, yes. um, I think, yeah. That a very reflective moment at the end of the film for yeah. and and we did too. In fact, it was the last shot of the film, so um, in in in, in, in uh, athletic way, it was just gorgeous to be doing. And may I say, the shot in Darwin, not in in Rangin, So there you go. So we'll take some audience questions now. You can see that there's one down here at the front. Do we have another microphone? Or shall I shout. I shout if you can. Hi, Anna. Thanks for that film. It was the photography was amazing. I'm just curious as to when in the process you decided to shoot anamorphically for such a close character piece. Always. <laughs> doesn't, um, always. We've shot everything uh, anamorphic except for The King Is Dead, which is my own film. It's just a, it's just a fantastic movie. You know, it's just it's widescreen and that's what Australia's about. It's gorgeous. Do you have another question? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Back. Yeah, back. Oh, okay. um, I know how difficult it can be to shoot uh, dark spaces against bright backgrounds without uh, looking lit. How did you make it look so natural and still exposed? I'll take that as a compliment, thank yeah, you. Yeah, well <laughs> um, well, I, I had a ball in the film, in yeah. fairness. Uh, I had a great crew, a very small crew. We don't work with big numbers of people. Um, and um, uh, the simple things that I'm not sure how many filmmakers are amongst us here, but the simple tools that we learn as young kids are the tools we've taken onto that set. So the idea is to, um, for me as a cinematographer, is to um, address what we have and then try and contribute to that. So part of that is um, with the thing called reflector boards, which we use quite a bit of. Um, and this um, I, uh, technology has moved in great, um, you know, forward quickly. And we've heard about LED lights. Well, there's now an amazing, it's called a cream source, which is an amazing Australian invention, which is now sold around the world. And um, they're a light, X big by X big, but they, you can plug them into your PowerPoint or you can plug them into your car battery. Now, how good is that? And so that's sort of, that's where technology is going. This makes our lives just a little bit simpler. And we don't have to have as much stuff around us now. Uh, I'm not saying that's the way you should be going forward, but in a film like the Rolf the Hear film, it's just gorgeous. So uh, those sort of tools help me get through that process. Um, also, may I say that the, the, they call it the um, post path, and in the post path, when we come to grading, 
Um, there is so much latitude. Um, any part of that frame you see, any any part of the um, um, what do you call it, the uh, sensor, uh, you can you can play with. And I'm not saying this film has been overly played with. This is natural as one would hope it to be. But you can modify things and, and um, light and darken over the process. And to be quite honest, in David's close-ups, um, which I think have come up magically, this is gorgeous and there's a little glint there at times, um, which is what I'm after. Uh, glint and eyes is life, and that's what makes you, as an audience, I believe, see inside the soul. Um, a lot of that, well, I don't want to say a lot of it, but parts of it have been manipulated in post, and not manipulated, <coughs> but just know the craft and it allows me that little piece to play with. And so we're just lucky in this day and age we have all these tools at our disposal. Mm. In the early part of the film, I really noticed the handheld aspect of the, the camera, particularly when looking at the, the, some of the houses around the village. And I thought, OK, I'm going to have to get used to this being just a little bit wavy. And then uh, it, it seemed to no longer be there later on in the film. Was there a change in the uh, technical aspect, or is it just that I just got lost in the film that was uh, Fire job, <laughs> Um, not, not intentionally. A uh, film called Ten Canoes were quite intentional about our changes, but no, not intentionally. The film is 100% um, Steadicam, and there's a gentleman called, um, uh, I think he's name is, I'll think we don't know. So it's 100% cam. We a Part of the, the toolkit is that you can take in lots of equipment, but it doesn't necessarily, uh, it can be quite hard bulky and time consuming. So uh, Greg Woolworth is the steady camera operator, Mango as I call him. Um, and so basically 100% of that film is steady cam. So it's been, as I said I think a bit earlier, because of the data rule we shot a few more takes. So in some ways we would have perfected probably something and the, the golly, golly gosh, uh, Tanya has used the take that I as a cameraman don't like, but you know, <laughs> have no say in it. Um, so it may be that scenario, uh, and in truth I haven't really noticed that as something you have, um, which is great, but it's not intentional. Uh, mm, I'll just blame Mango. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see this one back. Anyone else? Can't see with it. Yeah. <laughs> um, just a quick question, was it a long shoot, or how long did it take you? Um, it's, uh, I suppose to me it's three months, or just a week short of three months, so it makes it 11 weeks, I suppose. We were seven weeks, I think, in um, running the inning. Um, now, if you're aware, I did involve with a film called Ten Canoes, which were based in Ramagini, but it was shot at another place called um, um, uh, Malongi, which is sort of south of Ramo for about an hour south. And so for, we hadn't really, we used Ramo as a base before, but it's where most of the community was. So we were there seven weeks, and I think we were in, uh, in Darwin, probably shooting three weeks, might have been two to three weeks, but a little bit of pre there as well. Um, yeah. How the hell did those two old men lift that buffalo on the front of <laughs> <laughs> It's called Hollywood, isn't it? <laughs> Um, earlier when you started speaking you mentioned something about the script um, being quite different to the film. Um, is that because there was a fair bit of improvisation or what, what was the, what, why was it different? Yeah, um, you, I think you hit the nail on the head. There was improvisation, and, and as Tara mentioned before, it has a little bit of time, David's life in it. So one of the issues for, um, I suppose, actors generally, but I suppose in the Indigenous world, um, it's um, uh, acting, we see it as a, quite a, an easy process, I guess, so, from the other side of the camera, but, you know, for, for uh, if there's any actors amongst us, you, we know it's quite a too much for his period, you know, being on, to be in front of the camera. So in David's case, he did need to put certain things into place in his mind, and he has to honour certain things as well as an Indigenous fellow. So what that means is it's all very well 
uh, this group that certain things are going to be this way. He can't necessarily do that. That's something we we don't understand as white fellows. Um, and so, um, therefore, the, what we saw in the script and the involvement of certain, um, um, I suppose, the body language, the dialogue, um, couldn't be that way, so it needed to be the way David wanted to do that. Um, there was also scenes we probably didn't achieve for one reason or another, and so therefore the script had, had this uh, movement about it, which was when we make those links work so we might do something else. And David would always have input with that, and, um, and that had to be acknowledged. Mm. And, you know, for example, getting in the back of the um, police vehicle, I don't know how you found that, but when we shot it, I thought, oh mm, God, it was a bit harsh to us poor white fellas. I don't know if you that. Yeah, that's <laughs> and, um, but that's how David wanted to deliver it. And so you can't, it's not for us really, it's part of him, it's part of his script, it's part of who he is. So even for Rolf, he went, no, that's fine, we move on. Now I don't know how you all perceive that, but just on the set it was something like, hmm, mm, oh, there you go. And, and it, it was a very distinct moment in my time of remembering that moment. I think that's actually one of the things that gives the film the sense that we're not necessarily looking at it through just voyeuristic white people's eyes. I mean, there is a sense, obviously, of us as viewers, if we are white, we obviously bring that to the experience. But I think you do get the sense that some of what's driving the film, and particularly in the way that you shoot it with following David's actions and often then letting him continue on, does give you the sense that you're seeing the story from a different point of view. I think that's a real credit to the film. And he's a very proud man. He's, you know, he's as proud as Punch, and he deserves to be. Mm. Do we have any more audience questions? Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you've touched on the, you know, the, the answer to the question that I wanted to ask already, but was it? A, did you find at times that David was found it a bit emotional um, to do this film, or was there anger coming out at various times? There would have been, wouldn't there? All of it, everything you just said happened on the set, and that that actually had a big input into the, the script and a big input to how he delivered who he was or who the cut that um, the, the um, actor was on on the set. Absolutely, uh, all of the above. He hadn't actually been. This is inside information. Don't tell us. Uh, he hadn't actually been to his um, uh, Remagini in Alquiz. Uh, um, um, a community of made up of many um, mobs, as they would call them. He hadn't been there for 10 years, so it, that is a big issue. He'd been in Darwin for a long time. And so even that coming back into the settlement um, was a tricky one for us as well to, to put into perspective. So, yeah, no, all of the above. And, that, and you know, the, the, uh, coming back to country is really important for Indigenous folk. And they just, they just live for it. Um, and then, then to get on, on to, into his story, which how he saw it was his story, um, it was hard for him to get there at the time, so there's no doubt about that. We've got time for one more, if there's another. Over here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Good to see you. One of my favourite shots among many in terms of the framing and the light was where David's under the log and he just, is the, the shot is held long enough for you Mm. to want him to merge into the log mm. and to die there. Mm. And then when he's under the cave, he's, you know, in each of the places that he is in that journey. Uh, was that intentional that the, to take the audience there that it would be really great if he died in the country? Do you know if that was a, a conscious That's thing? That's probably more of a Rolf question, I guess. So <laughs> I, 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 can't, um, I can't answer it, but it is real rain and we waited for it and we timed ourselves for it. We went in the wet season, we left in the dry season. Um, but we felt that there's no, as a crew member and, and as a story pointed, uh, that whole wet sequence we felt. And David was more than happy to be there, which is just gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. I think there was one more which we'll take in the more. How old has David gone through now? 60. And he still moves like Michael Hutchins. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think everyone will agree this is a beautiful film and it's 
exquisite to look at, um, an absolute joy to watch. So thank you so much for giving up your time to talk to us about your process this evening and for making such a beautiful film for us to watch here in Australia. Um, please join me in thanking you.